Hello everyone and welcome to today's TF Together session. As you're probably aware, today, uh, the 25th of March, is Dante D, the day dedicated to the Supreme Poet Dante Alighieri. Uh, it's the second annual celebration of the event that was created by the Department of Culture in Italy last year. Uh, but of course, this year's celebration is all the more special given that it's the 700th year anniversary of Dante's death. So this is one of the many events that are taking place today to mark the occasion. And we've put together a lineup of those events at the link you can see here and which I'll share in the comments as well. And in that, you can also find the link to the official 700 Dante website and the Regione Toscana's recently launched site that details Tuscany's Dante themed events, which is called Dante o Tosco. And um, so one other point before we begin is that the Florentines Dante inspired March issue can also still be purchased. And that's called Let Us Not Speak of Them, Look Then Pass On. And that can be purchased at this link here. And I'll pop that in the comments as well. And you can also feel free to pop in as many questions as you'd like in the comments as we have our guest uh, deliver his talk today. And we'll have a question and answer session at the end of the talk. And so with that, I will bring on today's guest, which is Professor Martin Kemp. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor. It's lovely to have you on TF Together. Uh, Professor Martin Kemp is an art historian, academic author and curator who was the Emeritus Professor of Art History at the University of Oxford and also taught in St. Andrews and the University of Glasgow. I believe that's correct. Am I right there? Uh, that is correct. Oh, very good. I'm glad. Uh, you're also the author of a book which will be of particular interest to our viewers today, which is Visions of Heaven, Dante and the Art of the Divine Light, published by Lund Humphreys. And they have very kindly given us um, a code for that book, which you can see here and I'll share in the comments as well. And so with that, um, I will hand it over to you for what I'm sure will be a very interesting talk about the visual images evoked by Dante Alighieri's poetry. And I'll see you at the end for the questions and answers. Uh, Jane, thank you very much. It's an enormous privilege on this day of all day to be speaking to readers of the Florentine uh, to, to appear on Dante Day itself is uh, is very extraordinary. And uh, this gigantic, gigantic figure on whom I'm not an expert, but I've got little corners of knowledge, which I hope will be interesting to you. Uh, next. I will bring up this screen for you now and I will disappear and allow you to go through your slides. Right. I, I Hey, rather, rather brusquely, I should be saying next when the next uh, slide comes along. Uh, the book, uh, there it is. Why did I write the book? Um, uh, partly it's obviously fascination with Dante, but um, and obviously the trigger of Dante's 700th anniversary is too good to miss. Uh, two years ago, we had Leonardo's 500th, which was also too, too good to miss. But there are other motives for, for for writing this. I've written a lot in the past about the geometry of perspective and the rationality of light in the Renaissance perspective, Brunelleschi, and the science of art, as I called it, going up to color theory in the 19th century. So I've written a lot about the naturalistic tradition and how science, as we would call it, uh, informed that tradition in art. But there's another side to it. What do you do with divine light? If essentially you've used up all your visual resources from top level white to lowest level black in portraying a natural scene, what do you do with divine light? And bringing Dante together in this question also introduces this Renaissance theme of the paragone, the comparison between the various arts. Leonardo was a famous combatant in this, as was Michelangelo. But what can poetry do and what can art do? Can art do, visual arts do all the things as Leonardo claimed that poetry could do? So the paragone is embedded in that as well. And there's also with Dante this huge theme of how do we deal with the unknown? In Paradiso, as he travels there, he has privileges of seeing things which for the mere mortal are not normally seeable. And of course, this is a vital uh, matter in modern science, dark matter dark energy, these unknowns are 
of extraordinary importance. And we might describe Dante as doing light matter, that his unknown is the miracle of excessive and unbearable light. So throughout the ages, there's been this long-standing question as to what don't we know and how do we know that we don't know it? Um, so there are a number of uh, quite big themes running through the book. Next. Uh, this is re this states the question as to how do you handle divine light in a naturalistic framework on the left, as many of you recognize the famous uh, Simone Martini um, Annunciation in Siena, um, using gold as the radiant heavens and the spiritual presence. Piero della Francesca on the right in Arezzo with the fresco doesn't use gold. Alberti, the famous theorist of painting, said he didn't want people to use real gold. You had to paint it um, as, as if something were gold. And there you've lost divine light. Uh, God the Father sort of shovels um, the Holy Spirit down towards the Virgin. You know it's an angel and you know the subject, but um, divine light is not very apparent. Next. And if we look in detail at at the images, you can see the way that Simone Martini and Lippo Memi, his collaborator on this work of art, have incised these gold rays emanating from the Virgin in, in, a, in, a, in a corona of, uh, of light, tooled gold, which is obviously inaccessible to Piero, who has to resort to a not very spectacular halo. So that states the problem as to how do artists in this naturalistic tradition in the 15th century, how do they handle divine light? How do they signal it? And we should see some ways of doing this. I'll just show you a few examples which I've been looking at next. Uh, Dante himself. Uh, we, we know who Dante is, but let's just have a visual reminder. The Domenico di Michelino fresco, which many of you will know, I think all of you probably will know in Florence and the cathedral, a very nice summation, not the greatest picture in the world, but a very neat summary of the of Dante uh, opening the book at the Selva Ascura, where he begins his, his journey into, in, into, uh, per, into in the inferno on the bottom left, then the steady climb in purgatory up to the uh, garden, the, the garden of paradise, and eventually into into the uh, wonders, the celestial wonders of Paradiso. Now, Paradiso visually is difficult. It's quite an abstract thing. And Domenico di Michelino leaves it there as orbits of planets, the heavens with the planets in in their orbits. So it's quite a tricky thing. Dante is very visual, but he actually sets quite stuff uh, stiff. Uh, demands on his illustrators, anybody who tries to illustrate it. At the bottom, Dante going into exile. Uh, this is um, Giovanni Di Paolo, very beautiful illuminated manuscript in the British Library, the unfinished Brunelleschi Dome on the left. And um, uh, obviously Domenico Di Michelino shows it fully finished. And Dante writing in sad exile on the right. So uh, this is just to give us some background, which most of you will be familiar with. Next, please. Now, you might wonder in a talk about Dante, what are these two eyeballs doing? Um, the one on the left is from a 16th century edition of the writings of the great Islamic philosopher Ibn al-Haytham, known as al-Hazan in the West. Probably, the, I think, the greatest book on optics ever written, um, uh, known in Florence in, in an Italian translation. It doesn't survive, but we know Ghiberti knew it in Italian translation. Uh, Al-Hazan's book in Latin called De Aspectibus on appearances. <clears throat> on the right, the standard textbook of medieval optics. This is John Peckham, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, his Perspectiva Communis, the standard or, or common perspective. Um, the eye conceived in the, the, these medieval philosophers, one Islamic, one Christian, very complicated structure. They didn't have any sense of a lens, which was a, a focusing device. So they, partly on basis of anatomy and partly on the basis of how an eye might work, they constructed this very elaborate system, which I'm not going to go into other than to say that there's no focusing of the lens. 
Now, why is this there with the Dante lecture? We don't think of Dante as a scientist of optics, but he was incredibly well informed about optics. It was a major science in the Middle Ages. Optics was the science which testified to God's geometrical purposes. So uh, optics was a revered science, and it also was a science of divine light as well. So light is enormously important. Um, in the convivial, the banquet, the work that precedes the divine comedy to a large extent, where he provides his own commentary on his own poems, the convivial, the banquet, he describes very well the medieval eye. And let me just read that out. Here it should be shown that although many things can enter the eye at the same time, it is true that whatever enters along a straight line into the center of the pupil is truly seen and is the only one that imprints itself on the imagination. The fantasia was the receptive uh, quality that uh, uh, impressions first got, got impressed on. This is because the nerve, Dante continues, along which the visual spirit runs is orientated to this part. And therefore, one eye cannot really look into another eye unless it is seen by it, just as the one who aims their sight receives the form in the pupil along a straight line. So along that same line, its own form departs into the one it aims at. And many times along the extension of this line is discharged the bow of him against all weapons of feeble. Um, the bow is, of course, Cupid's bow. So a lovely bit of um, classical imagery and a poetic concept. And he's saying that because that perpendicular ray is the prince of rays, as Elbeth, he calls it, it goes straight into the eye. Cupid fires with optical logic. He fires absolutely directly down this. And it's it's unavoidable. As soon as you turn your eye on your beloved, the arrows come absolutely straight down the optic nerve and uh, strike into your brain. And of course, from there into the, in, into the heart. So there's a lot of optical science in Dante, as there is a lot of other other forms of what we would call science, scientific knowledge. Uh, next. Uh, all the time in the Divine Comedy, there are acts of seeing. Um, uh, Dante in the Paradiso, which is what I'm directly conserved with. I, I'm not concerned in the book uh, directly with the, the other canticles, but with Paradiso, the one about light. And Dante is repeatedly assailed by lights which he cannot see was there too radiant. And Beatrice, the beloved Beatrice, acts as a mediator and allows him to see things. Here they're looking at the Empyrean. This is the great fiery surrounding area of pure heaven, pure light, pure love outside the realm of the fixed stars. Um, and it will become clear why we've got an eagle there in a moment. Um, the blinding of Dante by divine light is equivalent to the blinding of him by Beatrice's goodness and beauty and equivalent of the unknowability of God. So love, optics and divine light and the light of the divinity all act in a similar way. In the Convivio, again, this is the uh, this is from the commentary he writes on his own poems. He writes at one point, in her countenance appears such things as exhibit a part of the joy of paradise. I mean in her eyes and in her sweet smile, for here love bears them as if to his lair. They overwhelm our intellect as a ray of sunlight does weak vision. That's from the poem itself, not the commentary, as I said. He then goes on in the commentary to gloss that as further. When it says they overwhelm our intellect, I excuse myself saying that I can say little about these things because of their transcendence. Here we must understand that in a certain way, these things dazzle our intellect inasmuch as certain things are affirmed to exist, which our intellect cannot observe. That is to say, God, eternity and primal matter which most certainly known to exist and are with full faith believed to exist, but the nature of their essence, we cannot understand them. So there is this surge of divine dazzle, the dazzle of Beatrice's love, the dazzle of heavenly light, the dazzle of the uh, something we cannot see with our earthbound senses, which Dante is allowed to see. 
he describes at one point um, how Beatrice can look into the sun, which of course we can't do. And it goes as follows. Beatrice had to her left flank, turned around to look at the sun. An eagle never looked at it more steadily as a second ray always issues and rebounds from where the first ray struck. Just like a pilgrim who wishes to return from her action infused into my eyes and by my imagination, my action was enabled. And I fixed my eyes on the sun as other than we can do. So like uh, the the reference to the eagle there is the medieval bestiary, the idea that the eagle alone could look directly into the sun without blinking. And this is a very nice manuscript in Cambridge, a medieval manuscript of Isidore of Seville's Encyclopedia. And there you can see a young eagle is being trained to look at the sun without uh, without flinching. Uh, you can see Dante's incredible range of reference and learning. But the message here is that Dante himself as a mortal cannot see this divine light. It is too extreme. But that Beatrice as an intercessor um, permits him to see things which the ordinary mortal can't do. In his visionary poem, he is granted extraordinary, extraordinary powers. And next, please. Uh, one, the climactic vision in the Paradiso is of the Sempinternal Rose, this great multitudinously petaled rose, which uh, with its wonderful radiant uh, radiant petals, which provides the, the thrones, the houses for Beatrice, who's already dead and has asse assembled to this uh, divine realm and the saints and so on. This is the... Uh, the vision he has of the Virgin at the center, he, Giovanni Di Paolo again, very clever Sienese illustrator. He's clearly just choosing a little bit of the Semp internal rose. Uh, he can't do the whole thing, but um, uh, very neatly giving a sense of the, of the wonder, the Virgin in the center, who seems to be pressing under her feet an image of Luxuria, um, an image of, uh, of degenerate luxury surrounded by leading saints and this is from this is how he describes it in the text itself so rising above the light and all around it i saw it mirrored in more than a thousand tears and the numbers of us who'd returned on high and if the lowest tier encloses so great a light what is the full size of this rose extending to its furthest petals my sight in breadth and height was not confounded that took in the full extent and nature of the jubilation. Nearness and distance add nothing, take away nothing, because where God governs without an intermediary, natural law holds no sway. That's to say the laws of perspective, the laws of distance, the laws of seeing in paradise with the powers that Dante has been granted don't apply. The, the, the laws which he had so hard learned, the terrestrial laws of optics, which we saw him quoting with with Cupid's, with Cupid's arrow. Uh, next, please. Uh, the ultimate, the final image in Giovanni Di Paolo's one is the Virgin, radiant with little sp specks of gilding all over her robe, radiant. And uh, again, Dante sight is enabled to see this extraordinary vision in a way which uh, which we on on earth don't have a chance to see the final vision of the trinity and what he calls our effigy he does giovanni di paolo doesn't show and dante ultimately his senses his ability even his enhanced abilities break down next please right at the end this is just before the very end, having been presented with this image of the Trinity glowing in a series of rainbow colours and uh, our effigy, whatever that is, and it's not clear what it is. At this point, my high imagination failed. L'alta fantasia, his highest fantasy, his highest imagination, his verbal powers, his abilities to see collapsed. So even for the privileged Dante, uh, the final vision, um, he surrenders himself to divine will. 
it's an extraordinary journey of which I've just given a, 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 a short summary, but the essence is of divine light as something which is uh, impossible for the ordinary person to bear. Dante is privileged, but ultimately even his alta fantasia uh, fails. Uh, next, please. In the transmission of Dante's vision into art, something which is generally overlooked is incredibly important, and that's, say, sacred theatre. Uh, these great theatrical performances of ascensions, annunciations, and, uh, the transfigurations, and so on, which happened in the Florentine churches, above all the Altarano ones, the, the ones on the other side of the Arno, Santo Spirito, Santa Maria del Carmine, and so on. Um, these incredibly elaborate machines, Brunelleschi was involved, and uh, they tend not to feature very much in visual histories because the visual record is quite small. <clears throat> We've got no direct representations of what they look like, but we can piece things together. And we've got a very nice description from a, a Russian bishop, who, Bishop Suzdal, who was visiting in 1439 for the Council of Florence. And he went and went to a number of these great theatrical performances, huge structures in these Florentine churches, huge structures of the heavens. And we've got an account by him. I'll just read you a little excerpt of it while you're looking at the this slide, and it will. Uh, I will then explain how these two things tie in. Um, this is just a section of the Festa of the Annunciation, which is represented on the left there in that woodcut in the book. The angel sent from on high by the father came down on the two ropes towards the Virgin to announce the conception of the Son of God. The angel was played by a beautiful curly-haired boy. His gown was snow white and decorated all over with gold, as was the angel's stole over his shoulders. He had golden wings and everything in his appearance expressed perfectly the picture of one of God's angels. He had on his back two small pulleys invisible from below on account of the great distance. These pulleys are supported by two ropes. Meanwhile, the third and finest rope is pulled by people who are high up, high up and out of sight to lower the angel and pull him back again. The appearance of the machinery is amazingly wonderful, even to grown men, and everything is decorated in gold. Um, that gives an idea of these. The, the slides we have there is a book devoted to these um, these spectaculars and you, this is the annunciation the, the fester uh, the fester of the annunciation and you can see the the paradiso are those orbits above this is where from the heavens these circular heavens in the form of a great dome shaped structure half dome the virgin the angel would descend to the virgin with all these uh, ropes being pulled and myriad lights lights and lights and lights on the very far right is Bonacorso Ghiberti, the grandson of the great sculptor who was an engineer. And this comes from his Zibaldone. And there you see a mandola, this shape, which would, the Virgin could go up or the, the heavenly figures, the angels could come downwards. And you see two, two of the pulleys there, two of the wheels with the, the pulleys. In the center is a painting by Mazzolino which is the summit of the Santa Maria Maggiore altarpiece. Um, and that gives us a kind of visual look of, uh, of these mandorle, these uh, almond-shaped ap apparatuses ascending and, and descending. Um, that they must have been the way that a lot of Florentines actually most vividly experience these, um, these sacred events. Next, please. Mazzolino is very handy. Because with Mazzolino, we know that he actually was involved in these uh, paradisi, as they were called. They're all called paradisi. Um, it was a collective name for all these depictions of divine events in the heavens. And this is a document to Mazzolino, the painter, for painting the cloud and for applying azure and fine gold. Um, Lira to due soldi uh, quattro. To the same for painting the angels who turn the cloud. Uh, four soldi in this case, 19, um, to Leonardo de Rigo Ironmonger. I won't go on reading the whole text, but 
this is a, a set of accounts for producing uh, the clouds, for producing painted images. And we know that uh, from descriptions, there are enormous numbers of lights. They must have been something of a, of a fire hazard. So in thinking about how Paradisi and anybody in Florence told though to witness a Paradiso could not have but thought of Dante. Um, these theatrical events were a major source of transmission and we'll we'll see them echoing through uh, through the course of this talk. And uh, next please. Perhaps the most evocative of all the 15th century pictures which seems to really almost transcribe the Paradisi, these half dome figures or fully domed um, heavens, these great structures. This is by Botticino, Botticini, Francesco Botticini, National Gallery in London, and is a very extraordinary painting painted for the Church of San Piero, San Pier Maggiore in Florence, now destroyed for Matteo Palmieri, the author Della Vita Civile on civic life, his most famous book, and a very extraordinary semi heretical book published after his lifetime. Uh, uh, about the t about heaven and souls and so on, uh, la, vi uh, la vita, a very very strange, very extraordinary book. Anyway, regardless of the heresies, this um, gives a very very good idea of the the visual appearance of the of the Paradisi and these great church festivities. Next, please. Anyway, to come back to our initial dilemma, um, what do the painters do? The, the theatrical people are fine. They can have candles and they had uh, lots of mirrors. They had extraordinary effects of, of light, which in the darkened churches must have been a, a very seductive, very brilliant. Um, but what does the painter do uh, posed by these two problems? On the left is Giovanni Di Paolo. I deliberately chose this Madonna because we've already seen Giovanni's Sienese illustrations of Dante, um, a work of which, what, 60% or more of the surface is gilded and, uh, and tooled uh, in this very brilliant array to testify to the, the divinity of the, of the Virgin and her position in heaven. On the right, again, Piero della Francesca, um, no imitation gold, uh, no real gold. Um, so it's a much lower key. And what do you do about divine light? Well, Perzo Francesca did extraordinary subtle things to suggest that in this naturalistic context, divine light worked its magic. Next, please. If we look in detail into the Senegalia Madonna, the Madonna now in the Plaza Ducali and Urbino, um, we can see the light streaming in the window and we can see, can we not, that there's a ray. You can see the beam of light which cut, cuts across, then hits the wall with a with a percussione. That's what they called splendore in optical treatises, that very brilliant striking of a surface. And you can, if you look carefully at it, it probably may not come up on your computer. The beam of light, which you can just see there, is full of little tiny spits, spots of impasto, lots of little tiny, tiny points of light. And this is a motif which was known in classical antiquity. It was known to Ibn al-Haytham, the optical scientist, and it was known to Dante. Next, please. Uh, this is Ibn al-Haytham, the Islamic philosopher. Let us, let us now mention something to prove the fact that light travels in straight lines is clearly observed in the lights which enter into dark rooms through holes. The entering light will be clearly observable in the dust that fills the air. Um, in classical antiquity, these are referred to as atomy, little atoms. That's a little experiment, a reconstruction I made with a cardboard box and, and smoke just to show you what sort of thing is going on. In Dante, in one case in the Paradiso, a cross is formed out of the dust particles, out of these little atomy. So um, whether Piero de Francesco got it from Dante, which is quite possible, or from his reading of um, the Italian version of Ibn al-Haytham's text, or from Ptolemy, we don't know, but it was a, a motif which appeared in the optical texts. 
And this suggests that there is something miraculous happening here. We know that light passing through glass was one of the metaphors for the virgin's virginity. And next, please. <clears throat> and even in the flagellation, which is almost a, probably the most Euclidean painting imaginable, the most geometrical painting imaginable, meticulous, meticulous geometrical perspective. And Piero wrote a book, De Prospectiva Pingendi, on the perspective of painting. Even here, if you look carefully, there are divine things going on. Look in the central vault above Christ's column. You see it's flooded with light. And that, that the beams, the cross beams, then cast diagonal shadows into their uh, apertures, their portions of the vault. And the statuette, this pagan statuette on top of the column, is illuminated from slightly below to the right as we look at it. Um, to the left inside the painting. And there must therefore be a divine source of light located quite near where that uh, the flagellator's upper hand is. And nobody notices the light apart from Christ. Um, the conspirators outside obviously don't notice it, but uh, the people participating in the flagellation, uh, Judas and the flagellators, don't see the light Christ does. So, Divine light, in this case, is a privileged light, which isn't uh, isn't accessible to the normal mortals. It is an assurance, as it were, to Christ that uh, he has not been deserted, that the divine presence is still is still with him. It's very subtle, very careful. It doesn't disrupt the naturalism, but it exploits a, a sense that natural light doesn't obey the law. Uh, divine light doesn't obey the laws. Natural light has to obey laws. Divine light can write its own agenda, as it were. Next, please. And perhaps the most brilliant of all Piero's uses of divine light is in the uh, dream of Constantine in the in the Arezzo frescoes. And um, the angel swoops like some sort of divine spaceship coming down, holding a, an absolutely brilliant white cross. Constantine, you may recall, uh, is due to go into battle against Maxentius at the Battle of Millinvan Bridge. And he has a dream stating if he goes into battle under the sign of the cross, he will be victorious. And the cross is here being borne down by this angel um, shooting out of the, the skies. And in an extraordinary way, the two soldiers and the his page don't see it. None of this, this great bright light and the sudden appearance of the angel, which presumably would have caused a certain amount of noise, is not seen. The Constantine is asleep in his bed, his eyes tightly shut, yet he sees it. So divine light again behaves not in a natural way. We will see in the next generation very similar things happening with Michelangelo. Next, please. The conversion of St. Paul in the uh, Cala Paulina in the Vatican, one of the lesser visited parts of the Vatican, uh, Saul knocked off his horse by this great shaft of light projected by Christ from the sky with the with the celestial hordes and the soldiers and uh, and Saul himself, I think in the biblical account, only hear the voice, they don't see the light. But the light comes down so forcefully, as I say, it's removed uh, Saul as he was, Paul as he was to become from the horse. Next, please. And he's holding up his hand to stop the light. <clears throat> but of course, divine light is not stoppable. It doesn't cast shadows. Um, one of the things that Dante learns in Paradiso uh, and in Purgatorio is he doesn't cast a shadow. He casts a shadow, but the spiritual figures don't. The people in heaven don't cast shadows because they're not material. And one of the phenomena he describes, Dante describes in the Paradiso is as follows. I felt waiting on my forehead, weighing on my forehead, a splendor much greater than before. Splendore, this key word again. So that I raised my hand to the top of my eyes and made myself a shield from the sun's rays to scrape away the superfluity. That's nice. It's the notion of scraping away the superfluity. But of course, his, optically, his head should be in shadow, but it's not. 
because the divine light penetrates regardless of what's put in its path. Now, Dante, of course, was um, one of Michelangelo's great favorites. He is known as an authority on Dante. So this Dantesque motif, I think, is not coincidental. But the artist who perhaps rather surprisingly most embodies the Dantesque light in, in the high Renaissance is Raphael. Next, please. We tend not to think of Raphael and Dante. We think of Leonardo and Dante. We think of Michelangelo and Dante, but not so much Raphael and Dante. But Dante, there are many clues as to how notable Dante was for Raphael. Dante is the only figure who appears in both Parnassus and the Disputa in the Vatican and the Stanza della Segnatura. Um, on the left, Dante is uh, above, the, above the window to the left, the stern jawed Dante with his guide Virgil and Homer, the blind Homer in front. And on the right, you can see again Dante with his laurel crown to the right of the figures to the uh, above the door to the right. Um, he's therefore seen by Raphael as a poet, which he obviously was, but also as a theologian, which if anybody reads, particularly Paradiso, um, it's clear he's an incredibly sophisticated theologian. Next, please. Dante's father was a highly competent painter in Urbino, but also a minor poet. He wrote a rhyming chronicle of uh, Federigo de Montefeltro, the, the, the Duke of Urbino, um, in Tetsa Rima, in these units where the first and, and third lines rhyme. Um, and he was called by a contemporary somewhat uh, incredibly as a, a second Dante. So although he died died when Ra Raphael was still a young man, his father was a Dantesque poet. Raphael tried his hand at poetry, but never got very far with it. But this is drawings for the uh, Stanza della Segnatura. And this is one of the sonnets which he was trying to compose. Um, he didn't take it much further, perhaps realizing that he wasn't a great poet but it testifies to his ambition. Next, please. And if you look at the disputa, it is a very uh, Dantesque thing, undoubtedly informed by the great Paradisi, the theatrical Paradisi. I think we can see, can we not, that this semi-domed uh, area at the top is, is very much in tune with the theatrical Paradisi, which is a Dantesque link but he's come up with amazingly varied ways of suggesting the uh, these Dantesque motives of the seen and the unseen. Next, please. Um, if we look in detail, we can see these tangible clouds, the sort of clouds on which they, they the figures stood in the actual theatrical performances, but then these nebulous cloud putty, the putty which are almost unseeable, which don't have corporeal quality, they're as ethereal as clouds. And then the cherubim, seraphim become, uh, they're done by painted and tooled gold uh, to become there and not quite there. These instances of the divine things being seen but not seen, semi-seen and elusive is a, a very Dantesque motif. Next, please. And this is exactly what you get in the Sistine Madonna. Um, it may be Fra Bartolomeo invented the cloud heads, the cloud putty, but Raphael took them to an extraordinary level. Here with St. Sixtus and St. Barbara and the Virgin with the altar curtain, the dark foil, it begins on the outside of the pictures with the putto heads visible as nebulous cloud heads. And then they bleach in this extraordinary way into this divine dazzle. A dazzle is, um, is the term that, uh, in translation, that Dante uses a good deal, um, giving a sense of the, the glare of something which is ultimately unseeable. Next, please. And very extraordinarily, and I think he must have known Piero della Francesca, the uh, liberation of St. Peter from prison. Um, in the left of the, the lunette, you've got three different light sources. You've got a, a taper held by a soldier. 
you've got a shaded moon and you've got the rising dawn sun, three different sorts of light, but they're all out uh, outgunned, as it were. They're all out brilliance, if there is such a word, uh, by the light in, of the angel rescuing Peter from prison, releasing his chains. The angel in a bleached orange and then this great aureole of, um, <clears throat> of, of light. It occurred to me this crisscross motif of the grid, which so brilliantly gives you the black to enhance the light. Whether he was doing a drawing for that central part, squared it up for transfer, and then said, ah, that's how I can make that contrast. Um, the description of the light in that central area, that little theater of light, with the light rebounding, the Pocussioni, the splendore, as it would be called, of the, the light on the armor is, is very, very remarkable. And then as the bewildered Peter, he's bewildered in the Bible and bewildered in the painting, the bewildered Peter is led out by the angel the soldiers on the stairs don't know what's happening. They don't even see it. This is very like Piers of La Francesca and the Dream of Constantine that um, only the privileged figures can see the divine divine light. And next, please. And the great final picture of Raphael, the altarpiece he undertook in competition with Sebastiano, who was being backed by Michelangelo. So in a sense, he was competing with Michelangelo, the transfiguration which is amplified by the next episode in the Bible where the disciples, the ones who are left behind, three have gone to a company, uh, gone up to the top of the mountain to witness this vision of Christ. In the lower parts, the remaining disciples in this rather chiaroscuro, this light dark area um, with the rules of natural light and um, fail to cure the, the blind boy while in the heaven, you've got the three disciples knocked over uh, by the divine light um, in much the same way as we've already seen. Whereas, it, it, whereas Ezekiel and, uh, and Moses are able to, who are resurrected souls, can see the, the light of Christ. Too bright for the mortals, uh, but seeable by those already vouchsafed in, in heaven. And once more, he's somehow getting that white. He's only got white lead at his command or another white pigment. But somehow or other, he turns the white pigment into light by sheer, sheer pictorial magic, sheer magic of the control of color and tone. And next, please. And it is this vision, this sense of uh, heavenly light that Correggio picks up. Correggio, I think, almost certainly had been to Rome, probably for 1520 or so. And the Sistine Madonna was only not too far from He's brought up in Parma, painting in Parma, but he undoubtedly almost certainly went to Rome. And the Sistine Madonna was in Piacenza, which is um, whatever the Renaissance equivalent of the A1 was, is not too far down the road. And I think we have to suppose he got this sense of how you portrayed figures in divine light, the unseen and the unseeable in relation to the tangible material presence of the of the bodies themselves. San Giovanni Evangelista in Parma, the uh, vision of Ezekiel. Um, Ezekiel, incidentally, is not seeable from the nave or from the main part of the dome. He's visible from the choir to the choir. So it was the monks who saw um, uh, who saw the, the Old Testament figure looking up with his eagle um, at the at the vision of um, of Christ floating in the in the air, and then in the great cathedral dome. Next, please. Uh, this really dramatic ascent of the of the Virgin ascending this sort of asymmetrical funnel of clouds going up into the into the light-filled area of the putto heads that bleach into a into a radiant a radiant gold. Um, it's sort of Raphael in three in three dimensions. Next, please. It is this that the great Baroque dome painters pick up, partly in Florence, but above all in Rome. Uh, Pietro da Cortona here. Um, for me, in writing this book, this was part of a journey of discovery. I knew 
decent amount about the Renaissance art, but I'd written less about the Brock artists. And I'd always regarded Brock art as very admirable, but in a somewhat Anglo-Saxon uh, atheist way, uh, Church of England atheist, as it were. Um, I'd always regarded it as somewhat outside my emotional range as going a bit far. But going at these images, Pietro da Cortona's dome in the Chie half dome in the Chiesa Nuova, um, I actually tuned into them via Dante to realize that this extremis, the extreme of light, the extreme of what's seeable and unseeable, um, was what these paintings were very remarkably getting at. Um, Pietro da Cortona, of course, from Florence, so he he knew and he knew the Paradisian, as we will see. He was a theatrical designer on his own account. Here, the assumption of the Virgin, but to understand it fully, we have to understand the full extent of his decorations in the church. Next, please. Um, the dome, the great dome of the Trinity, um, with the the dove of the Holy Spirit, is in the lantern illuminated brilliantly above, illuminated by special windows in the lantern above the whole scene. So we've got this very brilliantly painted uh, painted light and we've got the real light, the, the competition between the, the painter and the real effect, as it were. But what we should remember in looking at this, they're difficult to photograph these domes, but if you look at it in the church, the semi-dome is in the apse and the Virgin is ascending where is she ascending to? She's ascending to the center dome. She's ascending, as it were, behind the architecture to the Trinity. So these two need to be read in concert as a, as a kind of multimedia performance. And if we think maybe a, a, a Maria Assunta Est is sung in the choir, it would have been the most spectacular, spectacular uh, multimedia performance, as we would describe it in modern terms. Um, we lose a lot of the sense of the excitement of this. Next, please. Uh, Pietro da Cortona himself was a designer of theatrical events, Barberini, Rome. There were great competitions between cardinals and uh, the leading families to create the most spectacular visual effects in sacred theater. This is a Pietro da Cortona design for San Lorenzo in Damaso and its temporary architecture to be erected inside the church for a feast of the Quarantore, which was a 40-hour feast, mobile feast devoted to the host, uh, to, the, uh, to the Eucharist. Uh, and this event, we have a description of it, and we have accounts with thousands and thousands of concealed lights. So you go in San Lorenzo in Damaso, um, there'd be all this temporary architecture, which was used for a number of years, very expensive. And in, above the altar, there would have been this absolutely blinding array of, of concealed lights coming in and illuminating the host. And the processions went from church to church, and each church with their patrons vowed to outdo the other. So here we get in the Baroque. If we think of Baroque art as theatrical in that so a more generic sense. It's theatrical, you know, I think a very specific sense. And next, please. Nothing is more theatrical than what the Jesuits did, what Gauli, Giovanni Battista Gauli, Batticcio did in the, in the vault of the, uh, of the Jesuit church in Rome. Um, Bernini's protege from Genoa, um, creating what is, again, reasonably described as a multimedia experience. Next, please. Uh, painted figures, sculpted figures, uh, elements that are painted over the architecture. So you become unclear from ground level what is sculpted, what is painted, what is real, and what is invisible it was at the center of it. Next, please is the Jesuit's Christogram, the uh, IHS with the cross, witnessed by uh, Sant'Ignazio there in the lower part of the, of the vault. Um, the unseeable main realized in paint. Uh, Gauli is just extraordinary. Um, not known to us perhaps as a great name unless we go to Rome and look at them because 
there's not much in the way in art galleries. Uh, his great glories need to be seen in person. And this, I think, is a, is a just magnificent and amazing achievement. Next, please. Uh, and setting that against the other end of this central aperture, these dark figures, these dark Dantesque figures tumbling out, in, out into our space and uh, further down into 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 the inferno next please and the name of god the jesuit name of god wherefore god hath exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that the name of jesus every knee should bow it, it is a remarkable act of sacred theater based upon the the text based upon the teaching of the jesuits and uh, and based i think not maybe directly. Did he know Dante? Did uh, Gaoli know Dante? I'd be pleased if he did, but it's not necessary. He he is, in a sense, doing Dante in paint, whether he knows it or not. And, of course, he had many predecessors in paint who knew their Dante very well, including Ludovico Cigoli, who was in Rome and um, uh, who knew his Dante incredibly well and Federico Zucchero in Rome actually did a series of illustrations of Dante when he was in Spain so the Dantesque presence here is is general if if not if not specific next please and just to finish the last some quotes from the very last section he's gone through this journey meeting the saints seeing the Semp internal rose um, speaking to saints, being instructed in theological niceties um, and so on. And these are two excerpts right from the end, just to give you a sense of this great blast of, of light, which ends the spiritual journey. Eternal light existing in yourself alone, known to yourself alone and known to yourself and intelligible to yourself, loving yourself and smiling. That encircling which was so conceived appeared in you as a reflected light when my eyes inspected it rather more. Within itself and of its own colour, it seemed to be painted with our effigy. It totally occupied my sight. And our effigy is not prescribed. Is it an image of ourself? Is it something uh, completely transcendent? I think the latter is the case because at the end of the Paradiso at the end of the Divina Commedia, he says, next please. At this point, my high imagination, my alta fantasia failed, but already my desire and my will were being turned like a wheel all at one speed by the love which moves the sun and the other stars. Um, the end, thank you. Thank you so much. That was a most interesting talk and I'm sure people will have some questions so you can feel free to write them in the comments. Uh, it was most enlightening if I can say that. It was uh, such a special way to mark the occasion as well on Dante D and to, um, to maybe look at an aspect people don't typically think of first when they think about Dante is to think about the visual images. So it was very fascinating indeed to focus on that today so thank you for that much of the visual discussion and many of the illustrators of course center upon the inferno because picturesque sin is a very um, lively thing to show and purgatorio is full of interesting stories and so on but how do you do this thing in the paradiso which is just worthy figures saintly figures divine light spirits um, it's very difficult visually Absolutely. And I think for any of us who maybe have only um, a medium or rather average knowledge of Dante will be more familiar with the Inferno images, as you say, and certainly not as familiar with the Paradiso images. Um, in, while I'm hoping that we'll have a few questions come in, in the meantime, I'll remind our readers and viewers that uh, they can enjoy much more on this topic in your book, uh, which you've kindly given us an offer on of 20% off. So um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about what else they could find in that book and if they're so inspired to delve into that next. Yeah, I, I hope it, well, first of all, I should say Land Humphreys, the publishers have done an absolutely amazing job with it. Uh, 
it's a nice book to pick up. It feels very good. The paper is incredibly good and the reproductions are absolutely spectacular. And uh, I can say it's, it's such a beautiful book to look at and handle. Who needs the text? True. And um, we do have a question who, that has just come in. So I'll have a, put that up here on the screen, which was what uh, were the names of the two Raphael paintings in which Dante appeared? If that's a question that's that can be answered. Yeah, these are the frescoes. Yeah, I skate past these things fairly quickly. Um, these are two of the four frescoes in the first of the rooms he tackled in the Vatican, um, which was a major project when he arrived from Florence. He left Florence about 1507 or so. And he, the Santa Dino is the first of the rooms he, he portrayed, which was almost certainly um, Julius II's library. And it was devoted, there was canon law, civil law, and there's poetry, there's theology. And the poetry is Parnassus, the mountain supervised by Apollo um, uh, with the surrounding poets, the muses of classical antiquity and contemporary poets. Um, Boccaccio is, uh, uh, and uh, Petrarch, I think, are also there. Um, but uh, Dante in very distinguished company. Virgil, of course, is the guide of Dante through the first two phases. Virgil, the, the antique, the Roman poet, guides Dante through uh, Inferno and Purgatorio, but being a pagan, he couldn't do it in heaven. Beatrice takes over at that point. Um, so he, he's given good good company. And then he's there in the theologian in the, what is called the Disputa. This is not a contemporary title. Uh, it's called the Disputa. It's, it, it, it's seen as a debate about the Eucharist and the uh, the the uh, presence of uh, the presence of God's body in the in the wafer uh, and the presence of God's body and God's blood in the in the wine, which at that time sub transubstantiation, as it was called, was beginning to be contested. You've okay. got the Protestant Revolution coming up, so the the theologians are affirming the belief in the this vital um, vital act of transubstantiation um, uh, and the reality of Christ's body and Christ's blood. Um, so th there's the theologians down below, and then there's the heavenly figures who are affirming that above, and the light comes down from Christ into them, or from the dove, to be more precise, into the monstrance. There's a fiddling around with spatial realities there, which... Um, I won't go into without the slide, but um. not to worry. That Susan, who asked the question, also asked, uh, "Are they included in the book?" So I'm sure there'll be more information there if they are. Yeah, everything in the lecture is in the book, and a lot more. Um, that was a. Uh, it, I probably ran over ran over length a bit, but that was a, a, a rather rapid sprinted tour of what is. Uh, uh, it, it, yeah, there's a lot in the book, and. Uh, I say lots, lots of really, yeah. There's a visual story going on there. If you look through the book, I try to make my books a kind of visual story, which accumulates as the text goes along. Um, so the text uh, and they work as parallel constructions, and um, yeah, the, I, yeah. There, the, there's a lot I, I haven't obviously discussed in this um, in this talk. I will finish on just one last question, and then. Um, I will thank you for your time, but this is the last one, which I'll bring up, which is from Jesse, who first of all, thanked you for such a great lecture, which I can echo. And uh, she's asked if you could talk about the distinction between daytime illumination and nighttime illumination, um, meaning Dante's emphasis on stars as the ending word of each candidate. Yeah, Limey, that's a very, that's a, that's a very <laughs> tough question and based on a, based upon an absolutely, absolutely excellent observation. Uh, the, the journey, in a sense, overall is to one of um, one from darkness into light. Uh, obviously, in Inferno is characterized by blazing lights of, uh, of demonic fires, but not by radiant light of the heavens. Paradiso, you begin to get some vision of uh, celestial lights. The, the angel who 
stands at the gateway to Paradiso at the door, has a, a sword with, fl with flaming light, which Dante characteristically can't look at until he's given, uh, given assistance to do so. And you, you then in the Paradiso, you enter this world where there's that central light of God's majesty, which is the ultimate light unseeable, which is then reflected and refracted. And it's reflected and refracted into the angels, into the stars, into the into the heavens. Um, so all those lights are a are manifesting the transmission of God of God's light into more material form, into more 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 visible form. Um, it's a yeah, it's a light metaphysic. What I don't really look at in the book is what is often called light metaphysics, um, Plotinus and so on. For those of you who have a taste for such things, um, but uh, yeah, the, the all these lights all have their status as reflections, first hand, second hand, of God's magnificence. And on Earth, it's a very second hand reflection that we get as we climb the celestial ladder. So and into the Empyreum, this great orb of fiery light. Um, uh, we, we get to the, the raw source of that light with all the gradations in between. The treatment of light is, is extraordinarily subtle and complex. And you, 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 I was amazed in Paradiso at how these episodes of blinding, of not being able to see something how Dante somehow makes each different, he makes each compelling, and each has its own rationale. And the sheer inventiveness there, most of us, I think, could describe it once, but to keep doing it is amazing. And um, and in the Paragone, the, yeah, the I think Gauli gets to the point where he's, in a sense, equaling Dante to some extent, but he certainly isn't creating anything like that uh, imaginative variety dante's fantasia is just is just extraordinary it's true um and on that note i will thank you so much for your time this evening and to everyone who has tuned in uh, it's added so much to our understanding i think of dante's work to have these images accompany our reading and always so much more to read of course about dante it's a never-ending an um, intellectual endeavor really to look at his work and the images related to it. So thank you for exploring some of that with us. It's my pleasure. Uh, thank you to the audience for being patient. <laughs> no, no I will just finish by letting our viewers know that at six o'clock Italian time, we do have another Dante D themed talk on these channels as well with Professor Joseph Luzzi. So if people are, um, eager to keep going with Dante themed events today, you can join us again at 6 p.m. Um, so thank you so much again and goodbye to everybody.